Hello and welcome to the Aviatrix Book Review. I'm Liz Booker. My guest today is an award-winning historian, author, and broadcaster. She's written three historical biographies, including The Woman Who Saved the Children, a biography of Eglantine Jeb, founder of Save the Children, The Spy Who Loved, The Secrets and Lives of Christine Granville, who was Britain's first female special agent during World War II, and the Aviatrix Book Club discussion book for May 2021, The Women Who Flew for Hitler, a true story of soaring ambition and searing rivalry. She reviews nonfiction for the UK's Spectator and Telegraph and has given talks for TEDx, the Houses of Parliament, Royal Albert Hall, the Imperial War Museum, the National Army Museum and British Library, as well as many festivals. She has also been featured on television and radio for the BBC. You can find her at her website, clairemully.com. So I would love to talk to you a little bit more deeply about writing and, and yep. that process for you. So you, you've kind of shared with us how you got started on this whole thing when you were on maternity leave for your first book and writing about this woman who started, um, it saved the children, Eglantine, right. correct? You just woke up and decided you were going to write a book about her or you just were doing research. Tell me how that turned into a full length book for you. What, the Eglantine one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I was working at this charity called Save the Children and I came across the story of Eglantine Jeb. And uh, I actually only came across it because there was a photograph of her on um, my boss's desk, ab above her desk. And she was the sort of director of marketing and uh, branding, whatever, at Save the Children. And it struck me that Eglantine looks a bit like Alison. And I was quite terrified of Alison at the time, my direct line manager. I thought I really admired her. Uh, now she's a good friend, actually. But at the time, I just thought, well, maybe one one of those women is enough in my life uh, at any one time. But when I went on maternity leave, I thought, well, now's a good time to just find out a little about her. I thought I might write a little article for the Save the Children Supporter magazine or something. But Save the Children was then based in an old school, because um, it's quite cheap rent, I guess. And the archive was kept in what had been a swimming pool down in the sort of basement area. So I went down there and I found all these Tupperware boxes and cardboard boxes sort of rotting away. And now it's all very carefully looked after. It's, it's held in a London archive. But anyhow, so I just pulled out some bits. And one of the things I pulled out was this extraordinary leaflet that had a little, looked like a baby on the cover. Uh, and it, it was, uh, Eglantine had had this produced on her own, off her own bat, um, because she she knew at the end in 1919 because uh, the British government had a um, a blockade against Europe uh, against the enemy countries and the result of that blockade after the war after the peace was that the most vulnerable in society the elderly and the very young were starving to death because they couldn't get the provisions and Eggentine thought if people knew the human cost of that political policy they'd be as outraged as she was so she went out to Trafalgar Square traditional site of public protest and started handing out these leaflets which hadn't been cleared by the government censors and the one I had had her handwriting in the corner it said suppressed with an exclamation mark showing her outrage at what was happening and just to hold that in my hands it's like wow. wow so she was distributing these leaflets in Trafalgar Square and she was arrested for trying to help children and taken away because the government didn't want to fuss and then eventually came to court and she insisted on conducting her own court case, giving the reporters plenty to fill their columns with. And, and then she was found guilty on technicality and she hadn't got these cleared by the government censors. So fair enough. And she, but she was only fined five pounds, which was the minimum. It could have been five pounds for each of the 800 leaflets she distributed or a prison sentence. So so she was she held her head up to that. And she wrote to her mother, it's the equivalent of victory. And then after the, the court case was officially over, the crown prosecutor came up to her and he took out his wallet and very ostentatiously unfolded a five pound note you know these to be quite big these notes back in the day yeah. and he pressed it into her hands you know basically saying technically I got you but morally even as far as I'm concerned you've won the case and she was like no thank you I can pay my own fine thank you very much and um, but I will put this five pounds towards a fund to help save the children and that was the first ever donation to the Save the Children Fund charity. That's what set it up. I mean, that's, and that, that's just one story. It just went on and on. And I could just see the little pieces of the story, like breadcrumbs in these files. And, and then I went to visit the Jed family who still live in her childhood home. And they still fundraise for the charity. And they were amazing. And I was off and running. 
Took me seven years, though. So I was going to ask you about how long it took you to write these books. Seven years of well, research and writing for your first book. Well, yes, but and babies in that time, in life. I had my three yes. children. I did an <laughs> MA in the evenings and I was working as soon as maternity leave was over. I was working full time as well. So it was really it was a labor of love because I just loved this woman. Her attitude. She was so witty. She had a very black, you know, dark sense of humor. She's just fantastic. Um, so I did it as labor of love. Didn't think it would go anywhere. And then, uh, yeah, it won the Daily Mail Prize for biography. So I was thrilled by that. Um, Did you feel prepared for that kind of writing because of your master's degrees? It doesn't sound like you did a writing degree, but you've, did, you've done lots of research uh, studying history. So Yeah, I mean, I, I did the master's. I'd already started. It was, I'd already started looking into Eglinton. I just thought, actually, this is not an article. This is a book, and I don't know how to do that. So maybe I better go and do some proper historical research. So that's why I signed up for the MA. And, uh, and everything that I looked at in the MA was relevant to the book. And in the end, actually, they refused to let me do my dissertation on Eglantine because I'd already written so much about her for the MA. So I had to do it on something else. I was very annoyed. Um, but, anyhow, <laughs> but anyhow, that all helped no end, I'm sure. Um, yeah, and I loved it. And one of the courses was a biography course on that, um, which was yeah, very helpful. So. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah, that's mm. fabulous. I mean, so one of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm really thinking about is providing our women in aviation who think they might want to pursue writing, you know, the path toward that, the resources, what do you, how do you do that? But finding a master's in history, if you're somebody who wants to write biographies about somebody, where you can actually take a biography course, I think that's fabulous. That, yeah, it was just one strand, but it really, it was useful, so yeah. No, I'm sure. Yeah. And so you went into your second book with more preparation, you've had the experience, and so how have you honed your process? What does your process look like? Um, what what Ooh, have you learned think, along the way? Uh, I think one of the most important things that I found was, well, right from the start, I always open up by doing a um, chronology. So I do a timeline and it it's, it's so easy not to do it, but it's so, so helpful to do it. So obviously I put down the key, you know, birth, marriage, death, whatever, all the key, your subjects, key points. But then I have different columns on it. So it's an Excel spreadsheet or whatever. So just for general context, what's happening in Germany? What's happening in Britain? And suddenly you realize, oh, that's why she wrote that in the letter. Or that's why this led to that, because this is going on on the Eastern Front. So suddenly it makes sense. And you make all of these connections. And then you have something that's actually embedded in history and not just a story. And I think when you're telling Second World War stories, it's really important to know so for example one of the um one of the german pilots Luftwaffe pilots that i interviewed was based in ukraine uh in this particular period and he told me some very interesting stories how he'd met he'd been flown back to berlin he'd met hannah wright and that's why i was interviewing him and came back but i he also told me some fascinating stories of his work in ukraine he's a, a reconnaissance pilot so he was there to see as the front line progressed what the terrain was going to be for the soldiers on the ground coming forward and the tanks and so on but when I looked at what was happening in there, it was really interesting because at the time that he was, in fact, the most senior man on his base for a while in the Ukraine, that is when the Einsatzgruppen, so part of the SS that came in behind the troops and basically did racial cleansing. So we're talking massacres of tens of thousands of Ukrainian Jews. That's what's happening. And he never mentioned any of that to me. Now, he wasn't directly responsible. He's a reconnaissance pilot. But there's no way that when he was the most senior official on the base, he wouldn't have known about it. Right. And yet he still talked, you know, in certain tones about Nazi Germany and Hitler, he told me, was a great man in many ways and so on, and never raised any of this. And then that's what gives you the insight. And then you're thinking, OK, what is the story underneath what this man is telling to me? What else do we need to know? It's not just what's on the surface. And a chronology is a really good way to, to get your questions, to think a little bit more deeply about it. So, so that's a kind of useful spine to have, I think. You mentioned that you're going to be doing, you're doing a proposal for a new yes. book. And when you went out with your first book, did you do a proposal first or you already knew you were going to write this book? How did that process I, work for you to find a publisher? Yeah, no, I was quite lucky the first time around. So I was just independently trot trot off. I went and started writing on my own, doing my research, um, rewriting it all. And um, I heard there was something called the Biographers Club in London. So I thought, well, that'd be really useful for me. So I, I rang up and said, I'd like, could I come to your next meeting? And they said, well, what biographies have you written? I said, well, 
I haven't actually, I haven't actually written any yet. And they said, oh, I'm really sorry. It's just for published biographers. So I was a bit annoyed at that. And looking back, I think fair enough, because I, honestly, people contact you the whole time. And it's quite nice to have some space where it's just other people, you know, in the same zone. Yeah. However, at the time, I was a bit like, well, that's very precious. So I started arguing with this man. So well, I've got a really good idea for a book and I'm working on it now. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, what's the idea? So I told him about Eglantine and some of the stories, you know, and it turned out that he had just picked up the phone, but he was actually one of, you know, a very good English agent. <laughs> he said, oh, can I represent you? I was like, yes, you can. Oh, goodness <laughs> so, gracious. Well, nobody's going to replicate that. Congratulations. I was, lucky. <laughs> I was very, very lucky. But then, but then I applied for this Biographers Club prize. And, you know, I think seeking out groups like that as well can be very useful. And Well, that's what I was going to say. It wasn't just luck. You actually were actively seeking ways in which to expose yourself to the community. And that's, I, that's what writers need to do to, to find the people who are going to want their book. So you were it's very a bit fortunate. Of both. But a bit of luck we, as well. We, but, yeah. We're all fortunate because that, that happened for you. Oh, bless you. So you, so do you have it? He is your agent still? Um, no, he was my he was my agent for all these three books, but I'm uh, now with another agency. Um, nothing to do. My first agent was absolutely fantastic. He's also a great biographer in his own right, and I do follow him. We're still in touch. Um, the new agency had more representation for television and film and so on, so that's why I made the move. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And so, what you mentioned also having to promote your work. Tell us a little bit about that process does your publisher do any promotion for you are you out there on your own yeah. how does it go um well both of those things so um my first book was published by a sort of medium-sized publisher they've really grown now because they've published some fantastic books not mine but others well hopefully all of those um and they they did a little bit for me of trying to get me um so i think my first ever talk i gave was at the oxford literary festival and they'd organized that and a few others um, and then for my second and third books, I was with Macmillan, um, Pam Macmillan, St. Martin's Press in the USA. And they organised quite a full on um, sort of programme of giving talks at most of the big literary festivals. And um, they help get um, they help get the book reviewed. They send it out. They help um, try to get some sort of endorsements for you and all of that sort of thing. Um, they got me onto Woman's Hour. I've spoken about all three of my books on Woman's Hour, which is a big Radio 4 programme over here. Um, and, and they help with various other things like that. But, I, you know, it's difficult because if you're a great writer, it doesn't mean you have to be great at talking about it. You know, writing is quite a lonely thing. I spend a lot of time on my own, which I actually really love as well. Um, but I also like getting out there. But I know a lot of authors don't. But it does really help if you can sort of get into the swing of it because I set up an awful lot of authors talks on my own. I and mean, that's sometimes just emailing the festivals or um, I'm part of a group called the Historic Writers Association, whose prize I'm just looking at now, um, judging their book prize this year. And they um, do will coordinate panels of different authors in the same field. So I quite often speak as part of a panel on we, female pilots or female special agents or whatever. Um, but yes, I do a lot of, you know, getting in touch offering to write articles, doing blog tours, speaking at museums, museum programs, whatever it is. Um, so just always just getting out there and doing whatever you can think of. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of work. And it's thankfully, fun. it sounds like you're also, pa yeah, I was going to say, you're so passionate about these, these people that you've written about that it doesn't seem like it feels like work to you. <laughs> no, I, I do love it. And then I get to go to all these amazing festivals and listen to everyone else. And, and then you meet other writers and all of that's how it works. So yeah, so get out yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, that's exciting. That sounds really fun. Okay, so what advice do you have for uh, any of our members who might be considering writing biographies? Okay, now I actually wrote some down. I thought I'd get this one. Hang on. Oh, but my screen has frozen. Here we go. So advice. OK, so first of all, write about something that you feel passionate about. It doesn't have to be the biggest story in the world. Sometimes a very slight story can be very deep. So just write about something. If you're not really desperate to get to your desk and write about it, then no one's going to be desperate to read it. So write about write from your heart. Um, uh, read everything. Read everything everything that touches on the subject but also read other books that you think have been well written read other biographies that you think oh I love that author's style I mean I love 
um, Richard Holmes, I, I love Antonia Fraser, I love Claire Tomlin, and I love a lot more sort of, um, uh, a lot of writers are writing now in different ways, thick playing with structure, things like that. So just write around it and think about how you want to do it. But reading, reading is very important. Um, chronology, I think I've already talked about. Um, I think follow, be really determined. So I send out emails and letters all the time. I think of them, this is probably very silly, but I think of them as pigeons. I send them out and I just really hope they're going to come homing back to me with something. And when they come back, and they do, not all of them, but you get a percentage back, it's just fantastic. You think someone I never knew in Moscow has got in touch or, you know, and, and think of unusual ways. So I, I sometimes trace people through, everyone's doing their family histories, right? So there's some very good websites like ancestry.com, whatever. So think outside the box and get in touch with people that way as well. And then when these pigeons come back, that's that's fantastic. You get something really new. And the other thing I think is um, I have always fallen in love with my subjects, apart from Hannah Reich. So I fell in love with Eglantine, Christina, definitely. But I think there has to be a moment where you think, well, actually, mm, no. Why did you do that? And that's wrong. And now you're sitting under a tree crying. Just pull your socks up, get up and get back in there. Or, And I think you have to fall out of love with them again. You know, if you're going to write an objective book and not just a hagiography, you want to, yes, you want to feel for them, but you want to get cross with them and have a bit of objectivity and perspective as well. So don't worry if you end up getting annoyed with your subject, maybe it's a good thing. That's, that's what I think. This has been fabulous, Claire. Thank you oh, so good. much. I mean- It's a pleasure. It, you are just lovely to talk to. You are clearly oh. passionate about your subjects as you recommend nice that person. people should be. Oh my gosh, yes. I, and, and now I'm a huge fangirl. So thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you very much for inviting me on. I hope everyone, I've, I've enjoyed it. I hope everyone else has as well.